Hello chess friends. Today I'd like to talk about Magnus Carlsen's best chess game. Now, as you can see, I've had quite a bit of a difficulty figuring that out because you can now he's made a lot of quite a lot of great games, quite a bit of them brilliant positional masterpieces. So, I've selected the game that he played when he was younger. It's an easier to understand game and it's easier to grasp and, you know, learn by. The game was played between him and Hans Grohe Hostet, rated 2250. And I think there is a lot to understand, there's a lot to learn from this game in general. Let's take a look and see what it was all about. After the moves of e4, e5, knight of 3, knight c6, bishop to the b5, as he was played. Okay, then uh, basically black decided to do a6. And so after the move of a6, surely white plays bishop a4. Knight of 6 and short castles. So of course here, up here, we see that the, the white development is all going towards one idea. He wants to support the center and possibly break through, most likely with a move like pawn to d4. And it does look quite good, at least at, at the beginning. Now with that in mind, black played b5, bishop b3, and bishop b7. He didn't look for anything too special, he just wanted to um, develop his own pieces. So what comes out now is really interesting. Rook e1, d6, c3, castles, h3. If you look more carefully or more closely to this position, you find out what this is really about. It's not so much the center, even. Right now, it is much more about white simply bringing up the pieces that he needs in order for his play to become better and having them closen up towards the middle. Now, this is going to take some time to do, but it's very important that white does it. And so white does it beautifully now. He goes on with a kind of a move like uh, pawn to the c3, we're actually preparing ourselves for a quick d4 challenge, and it's beautiful. What comes out next is also really good. Knight a5, bishop c2, c5, d4, and knight d2. The great thing about Carlsen's games is that in a lot of them, he sets up a great build, you know, he, he creates a great build-up. That literally means that he gets the chance to position many of the beaters and slowly maneuver them, slowly transfer them to uh, an attacking position or, or a great place. It's, it's always a good thing to have that. And now we realize what this is really going to do. It's, it's just we're having the, uh, the chance to move that knight around. We can have it go to the f1, through, through that through, you can go to the e3, d5 or f5. It's beautiful. So white's doing it. Knight c6 was played. Black, of course, wants to attack the d4 and possibly create a challenge. Maybe c takes to the d and knight takes d4. Or c takes to the d and knight to the b4. It made a great sense, actually, for him to do it this way. But then white closes the position. He locks it up with d5, knight d8, and then there is a4, which is a great variation. Beautiful to see. A wonderful as as an opportunity and uh, naturally we understand the thing with rook a7 and knight f1 white is simply getting a, a hat with a powerful idea knight f1 is going to bring white to towards the other concept of playing g4 and then with g4 in mind you can play knight g3 the build up always expands and that's something you always want to do in these positions. You'd always like to think of a way on how you could expand it, how you can get more space or do more out of it. It's a great idea. So actually, in this type of position, things are perfect. Now, what about black? Can you do anything like that? And uh, I think that's possible. But uh, after the g6, white does bishop h6, rook e8, knight g3, knight e7, and not h2. And now you'd like to see how effectively every piece that white actually goes on with onto the king's side is well placed. 
There's not just the move of knight g4 that we're going to do, but there's also queen f3 that we can do. There's knight f5 that may be played out also as well. I mean, there is plenty of excellent moves. And what is so good is we're just in the right condition to do so. Now, how do we know if we've got the right time to do all this stuff? It's pretty interesting. Time always depends on what the opponent can do. Don't forget that. If your opponent cannot do anything, it means you've got more than enough time to set everything in motion. So Carlson knew that, and in a way, his goal here is to gradually regroup the pieces. Now, one of the first key lessons of any successful strategy is regroup. Regrouping allows you to gather the pieces and the, you know, the forces and possibilities that you need in order to uh, make everything work. And so actually what we see is that there's not h2, black plays f6, and now white can even play with the move of uh, bishop to the e3. So this is a great way to follow. We also have that possibility to think of a knight g4 move and possibly plan up with f4. Rook f1, queen f3, maybe even knight h6. It's really just so exciting to have the option of uh, you know reaching out and attacking against the black king. But more importantly, it is the black inability to do anything on whichever area of the board he chooses to do it. So we got pressure on the king's side, quite some active pieces, and a lot of wonderful resources that we can build up. So now, black had to play knight to b6. He decided to do it this way, and his intention is, of course, to come across the move of knight c4. White played 8x to the b, 8x to the b, and bishop d3. Now, how do we decide to play in the opposite area? I often tell my students, do not do that. You know, if you start moving on a certain side, you know, just completely forget about other sides of the board, completely forget about different areas. And that's always a right idea because you don't want to be moving anywhere else. So why is White Dem playing a move of 8x to the B in this position? Why is he choosing to open up purposefully? The reason why he does that is actually, it's just one reason really. The reason why he does that is because he wants to stabilize. Before the exchange, Black was creating problems not only to the c4 square, but also to the a4 pawn. So he was intending to make some exchanges and do some unpleasant stuff out there. But then the sooner we play 8x to the b, 8x to the b, and then bishop to the d3, there is no more danger. There is no more pressure on that line. Now think about that. If there is no more danger and there is no more pressure, we are perfect. The queen set, sets up on the d2 now. We're ready to go ahead with moves like f4 if need be. And we have all that we need in order to carry on and further attack him on that area. Step by step. That is a wonderful idea. See, and that's what I want that's what I need you to do. In most of these positions, you want to be thinking about, okay, how can I gather those forces, put them quite close, and attack. With knight of seven white exchanged, he played queen e2 and then knight g4. You see, it takes time. It is not one of the things that you can easily do by saying, oh, you know, I want to go on the king's side. Let's do that. That will not work. But if you focus on gathering there your pieces and the pressure and just really make it, it will help. Very interestingly, but it does help. And so what we're actually dealing with in this position is White's opportunity to build up and maybe create more pressure. Black did the move king to the g7, apparently not one of the best candidates. But, um, you know, after that was done, of course, White could do many moves. In this case, he played with the move of bishop to the c1. He picked that one up. And it's understandable. I mean, bishop c1 creates the threat, the possibility of bishop h6 at any point if we need it. We've got f4. If we decide to open up the position, f4 is going to do it, that's for sure. So we've got the space, we've got the activity, we've got it all, and it's it's looking good on the king's side. Black plays knight a4, of course bishop c2, quiet move. Maybe we could even prepare to challenge black to you know back to black knight in this case, 
there is definitely a lot of oppor opportunities, a lot of ways to keep up against the opponent. Then, as soon as this was done, Black played Rook eight eight, and now you may be wondering, okay, so I think that so far things were done, you know, whether they were done perfectly or not. White has already occupied some of the best positions for attack, indeed. And yet, how do we continue? Because, you know, being well-placed and having good pieces is one thing, and usually it's a good thing. But making sure that those pieces matter, that they can create threats, and that's a different story. And so after Queen E3, White starts working in, on a new direction. He wants to have these lions and possibly pieces, you know, really ready to challenge the opponent. And then, of course, that's how we can get things like uh, knight h6 being played, f4 being done, and so on and so forth in a few moves time. That was wonderful. Black played c4, white does rook to the f1. Knight there, knight h6, knight g5, f4, trade, captures, black did this, and then white simply plays alongside queen h4. What I find awesome about this example is just like the idea of white just setting up. And it doesn't matter that black won a pawn. It doesn't matter anything that he did. It is white's play now. And white's intending to make it full. It's all about pressuring and advancing on the only area of the board that really matters. King side. Bishop d7, e5. And I find this the key moment in the whole game, which is pretty much the most instructive moment in the whole game. It is when White chooses to finally break and actually allow himself to open the pieces. This is wonderful. Not just a key idea, but, uh, you know, what, that's, that's, that's how we're following through. You know, so uh, one of the uh, most essential things that you've got to remember, I remember, is that um, see, rule number one. Rule number one. You've got to think about how you can get more pieces against the opponent. How do I do that? Once that's done. Everything's great. D takes 3, not h5 was played. G takes h, queen takes g5 was done. And I want to show you with this last move the, the showdown that's coming at like that, the Black King. It is totally, totally unprepared. He cannot do anything. He cannot fight it. Not now, not anymore. Wow. I mean, this is this is really... The, the, I mean, I, I said showdown, but it's really just that thing. Rook f7... And rook takes h7, but the most important is that black couldn't have stopped it. Even if he wanted to, even if he possibly had a way, it wouldn't have been here. Wouldn't have been right now. So he would lose because all of those pieces that he's got are totally opposite on a very different side of the board. As opposed to whites who had everything happening on the area where, where black's king is. Hope this makes sense and you're able to take a couple of these and apply them in your next games. Mm -hmm.